The focus of, uh, of my talk will be on uh, management strategies uh, that would enhance or optimize the habitat conditions for rupia in the Kurum. And for those of you who are from Indonesia, I'm not talking about the money rupia, <laughs> I'm talking about the sea glass rupia, obviously. Um, this is work from a whole uh, range of uh, different scientists and I'm just the uh, uh, fortunate one to be able to present this work to you today. The Kurong uh, is a uh, hypersaline coastal uh, uh, lagoon system uh, in South uh, Australia, um, bordered uh, from uh, and protected from the ocean uh, by a narrow extensive uh, sand dune peninsula. And the uh, site was uh, established as a Ramsar site of international importance due to its uh, value for water birds in uh, 1985, covering about 140,000 hectares. And this uh, hypersaline lagoon system is connected somehow to uh, the Murray River system, uh, the largest river in Australia, which drains uh, about 25, 30% of the country. And the lagoon system consists of two parts, the northern and the southern uh, lagoon, just like uh, Korea, northern and southern Korea. <laughs> and we will uh, focus in this talk on uh, Rupia, uh, tuberosa, which is uh, one of the keystone species in the in this wetland system. Following a, a period of about 10 years of virtually no rain at all, as known as the millennium drought, uh, the uh, lagoon suffered uh, uh, tremendously from drying up and from ever increasing salinities. And combined with the over abstraction of freshwater in upstream uh, areas of the catchment of the Murray River Basin, uh, that has resulted in a, a dramatic loss of seagrass, uh, of rupia, and also uh, led to the depletion of its seed banks and a massive decline in the water bird numbers. When then uh, finally rains returned, uh, the recovery of rupia was uh, very uh, limited and uh, instead what we did uh, observe was massive algal blooms and these algal blooms uh, are potentially uh, hampering recovery and also interfering with the growth and, and uh, life cycle of rupia through a shading of the canopy and also uh, uprooting and pulling out the flowering uh, stalks of this uh, seagrass species. Just a map of the uh, area. Let me see what is the pointer here. Uh, we see the Murray River in the north, um, uh, two freshwater lakes where they are trying to keep as much as long as possible freshwater reserves to help in the irrigation of agriculture and urban use of fresh water. And then here you see the two narrow uh, coastal lagoons connected, but there are uh, barrages that have been put there to keep the fresh water as long as possible in. And in, terms, in times of excess fresh water flow, they will be able, able to open them and let the fresh water out into the ocean, but with an option also to replenish the coastal lagoons. Um, Due to the uh, um, ecological uh, uh, degradation of the system following these severe droughts and all the upstream uh, management issues, a project was erected called the Coastal, sorry, the Kurong Lower Lakes uh, Management uh, Project that had as its objective to try and um, investigate or test different options. How can we bring back more fresh water into the lagoon system to revitalize the system and get the rupia back and the water birds back? And there's basically two options for the freshwater to enter back into the system. One is uh, through the uh, barrages in the north, and the other one is uh, an alternative route that was established by creating connections with other sources of freshwater from uh, irrigation systems here further down from the south through what is known as the Salt Creek. So those are the two uh, different uh, uh, areas from where the freshwater can be entering into the system. Uh, the objective of our uh, contribution to this larger Kurung uh, Lower Lakes uh, project was to analyze uh, different potential management strategies that would optimize habitat conditions for uh, a good recovery and return of rupia into the system. And we did that by, uh, first of all, conducting very thorough literature review on all the information we could find uh, on rupia and on the Kurung, obviously. And secondly, by uh, conducting a series of um, experiments, manipulative experiments on the seagrass and also on the uh, macroalgal bloom um, to fill some of the knowledge gaps that we identified in the literature study. And finally, 
we pulled it all together in a predictive model that would be uh, allowing us to test different strategies and different uh, um, scenarios. Here you see uh, an impression of some of the uh, experiments that were done uh, with Rupia in a tank system to uh, subject them to different levels of shading to test the minimum light requirements of Rupia. Um, by doing so, we discovered we are not just dealing with one species, but we're not just dealing with Rupia tuberosa, but also with Lepilena, which has changed its name overnight, apparently. But, and uh, there are reports that there is a third species in the system as well. Uh, but basically, these experiments uh, gave us uh, information about the, uh, the minimum light requirements for Rupia. And the experiments on the algae were done in uh, laboratory conditions to test the effect of salinity, different salinities on the growth and uh, health of the algae. And again, we discovered we're not just dealing with one species of algae, but three. It's a kind of a complicated experiment, but it was dominated by Ulfa paradoxa, and that gave us information about the bottlenecks, the thresholds be above which uh, the algae uh, get it very difficult, and that was salinities over higher than 80 parts per thousand will cause the algal biomass to decay and, and not thrive. The all the information together with literature uh, data on habitat requirements for Rupia was then pulled together and uh, built into a model that would help us to predict. Uh, this model, oops, this model um, consists of a hydrodynamic and biogeochemical module that calculates for us the water flows and water levels and all the water quality processes that yields all the information we wanted to test so the water levels temperature salinity the light reaching the plants and the build-up of microalgal bloom biomass and that was then compared or tested uh, against uh, what we know from literature and experiments uh, the what constitutes the habitat requirements for rupia uh, rupia is of course a bit of a complicated plant because um, Rupia tuberosa is the species we focused on, uh, an endemic species for uh, southern Australia, by the way. Uh, Rupia tuberosa has a double life cycle, if you like. It can reproduce either vegetatively by the formation of turions that then uh, uh, remain viable in the, when the place dries out or becomes extremely saline. The plant biomass disappears, but the turions remain behind. And when conditions return, when fresh water and, and water comes back in, they can sprout and form new plants or the sexual life cycle through flowering and production of seeds which build up a seed bank which can then germinate and form seedlings from which the cycle continues. All these different stages in the life cycle uh, do not necessarily have the same environmental uh, requirements. So their tolerance to salinity or to water levels or to light uh, differs between different stages of the life cycle. And these different stages of the life cycle also don't all happen at the same time, but they are spaced out over the year. So we chopped up the year in three months periods and, uh, and tested for the different parts of the life cycle um, what the different scenarios would do. Here you see on the left three uh, maps of the lagoon system um, with the northern lagoon, the central part that connects it to, and the southern lagoon. And you see here the suitability of the habitat conditions for Rupia for the adult plant stage, for the flowering, and for the seed germination. And if you stack them all together, you get a sort of an overall habitat suitability for Rupia tuberosa to be able to complete its entire sexual life cycle in this lagoon system. And you see that that is largely limited to the central part of the lagoon for this particular uh, year, 2015, which was our base case scenario. We then also did uh, the same for uh, three different years on a row and noticed that the results uh, can differ quite dramatically between years and get quite a lot of difference from year to year, which is all dependent, of course, on the initial conditions, which are a function of the rainfall and other things that have happened in the previous year. We then were able, after the model was kind of validated against field data, we were able to test a number of scenarios and management uh, strategies. Uh, on the left here, we see uh, the first, which is the base case for 2015. Um, the map on the top is the northern lagoon. The ma map in the center is the central part of the lagoon system. The map on the bottom is the southern part of the lagoon. And you see that in the year 2015, uh, most suitable uh, habitat was all centered around 
the middle part of the lagoon system. If then uh, you would completely close the barrages and uh, let zero water coming from the north, you see that um, that habitat suitability degrades, but you get some fringes along the shores in the northern lagoon that become suitable. And if you were to open them up maximally and get the most fresh water to come in from the north, you will not necessarily find that the overall area of habitat increases, but you just see the suitable area of habitat being pushed further into the southern parts of the lagoon. And finally, we try to maximize the amount of fresh water coming in from the south, and then you see the total area of uh, habitat increasing from the south, obviously, but also in the middle part of the area. These model uh, um, solutions or these modeling scenarios, um, we can conclude a few things. We, we did many other uh, scenarios, but I won't go into them. Um, but basically, you can conclude that the effect of different management options on rupiah clearly depend on the starting conditions of that particular year, which means you, can, you may not necessarily have to do the same thing every year. It really depends what has happened. The complexity of the system and the different requirements of each of the phases of the life cycle of rupiah make it difficult to generalize uh, what would constitute the best flow conditions to maximize uh, survival for a rupiah. And uh, what was quite striking is that uh, the maximum amount of extra uh, improvement that you could uh, accomplish by, m by manipulating the, the freshwater inflow into the system was roughly in the order of 20 to 25 percent relative to the base case. And that is uh, less than the natural a variability you find from year to year. So there's really not all that much control that we have over the habitat uh, suitability for rupiah. And for management, we then recommend basically the most basic one is to uh, focus on maintaining the water levels in the lagoon system for long enough to allow rupiah to complete its life cycle and then to prevent those algal blooms by um, minimizing the um, uh, drop in salinity below levels whereby it becomes favorable for the algal blooms by minimizing the nutrients uh, inflows into the lagoon from those sources of fresh water you bring in and by managing other aspects of water quality that would uh, favor the algal growth or would um, disadvantage the, the rupiah. The take home message of my uh, presentation really is it is not simply just add more fresh water and you'll get more rupiah. I hope that you can remember that from my talk. It is a bit more complicated because of the bathymetry and the life cycle stages and the conditions from year to year. And the reality check again is we are not only dealing with rupiah in this system. We focused on how can we ma manipulate such that we create the best circumstances for rupiah to recover. But the managers also have to bear in mind the upstream uses of the water for irrigation, for agriculture, and they have to manage the water levels for optimal uh, conditions for the water birds and the fish and you name it. So, and with that, I thank you for your attention and all the institutions. Thank you. We have two minutes for maybe two or three questions. If you dare. Gary. Yeah, so for each grid cell of the model, you have to uh, have, uh, for the period of, let's say, seed germination, you have to uh, assess for that three-month window uh, how suitable is this grid cell of the model during those three months that seed germination normally happens in the field, how suitable are the conditions for that grid cell, and then you have to do for the next set of three months how they grow up. Well, for the plants to, to complete its entire life cycle, it has to be able to successfully go through all, those, uh, all of those. But the, the final score will be the lowest of, of the three, if that makes any sense. Is that what you're after? Uh, that explains why the lowest score is probably the so Yes, of course, yeah. Because it might be all very well that it can germinate, but if then the conditions are very poor for the adult plants to flower, for example, then it basically means it's, it has very low chances of making it 
year after year to complete the life cycle. Even though they could germinate, but they don't make it to flower. Correct. So no, so but we, we are dealing with a system where the seed banks were totally depleted. Yeah. So we can't make the assumption the seed banks there year to year, although in some places it does, because um, of the stochasticity across the whole site. So for some years seeds come and go, and there is a persistent seed bank year to year, but it's not consistent. So just a warning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we should talk about that because because we do want to do that next, but the problem is we don't know where the seed banks are yet. And given that this is a spatially explicit model, we can't go go to that next step. But we that's what we're going to try and do this year, literally this year. Okay. Time is up. I'd like to uh, thank you.